That is so great to have nieces and nephews that know how to work. I tell you what, some people say that the next generation is doomed, but I think there's some good ones out there too. Thought I'd show you real quick. The developer uh, needs to be changed on here. Uh, it's, it's getting iffy, uh, but text looks just fine. Half tones are starting to get kind of cloudy and the density isn't there, so I have developer on its way. Uh, but a little thing that I'm doing on this project uh, is gonna make the photos look a lot better. Uh, and it's little things like this that it's good to do if you have the opportunity. So this is a really thick book, uh, 600 some pages. And it's pretty much all text, except for the last nine pages. So what I did was I printed the last nine pages of black and white photos on here. And then I'm doing a post insert here. So it'll print the text and then it'll pull nine sheets and the slip sheet and then keep going. Well, finally done that. That took a while to print. I'm always amazed at how much of a workhorse this thing is. It just chugs away. And I see here that my developer has went beyond what it wants here. It's a one and a half million clicks. And I just got that in the mail today. I also need to replace the upper web. That uh, light has come on as well. Um, but as long as I'm printing text, I'm just gonna keep on running this. It shut her down. Good work this week. Uh oh, it's that time, time to plug her in again. Let's get this paper out of here first. I'm gonna wait to charge that till Monday. Something about charging a battery overnight when I'm not here during the weekend just kind of scares me. I don't know if it's because I'm a firefighter or what, but I like to be around when battery's charging. So I've had several people that wanted me to go into a little bit more about folding and the different types of folding. Um, so I'm gonna do that right now. Now, two of the, probably the most popular folding methods would be buckle folding and knife folding. Now, in uh, like newspaper production and web applications, you also run into a third type, which is plow folding, which is when you take a web of paper and kind of slowly bend it over a plow, which folds it at a precise spot. So I have two buckle folders in my print shop uh, that use the exact same technique. The tabletop is a buckle folder and this MBO is a buckle folder as well with the right angle option. So it's a floor model folder. And you can kind of see here, this is kind of cutaway of the different rollers and how the paper buckles at each one. So your paper is gonna come across it will go in between two rollers, which are these top ones. It will go up the first fold plate right here, and it hits this stop. When it hits that stop, it no longer moves forward, but down here at the roller, it begins to buckle, and it starts to push the paper down between these two rollers, and that is where the fold happens. Uh, and then this particular folder has two lower plates and two upper plates. So I can divert the paper down into the bottom plate and then an upper plate and a bottom plate or the bottom plate twice uh, or the upper plate twice. You can do multiple different types of folds here in a buckle folder. And like the MBO, this AB Dick tabletop folder has two plates. Um, one on the top and one on the bottom. So you can do a smaller amount of folds on this folder. Uh, another difference is that you can't adjust the distance between your rollers. You see the spring here? 
uh, there's just springs that hold the rollers together. So as multiple, as you make a fold and it, you know, it goes from one sheet of paper to a trifold, that roller is going to need to open up as that fold kind of builds before it exits. Now a knife folder, I have several of those too between different machines. This right here is a knife folder. There's a knife located right down here. And I doubt I can make it cycle. I need, I need a light. You can see along the bottom there, there's a knife. And that knife pushes the paper up in between two rollers. So rather than the paper coming through here and hitting the stop and being continued to push and buckle up, it comes in and it stops and the knife pushes it up. Now what are the advantages of a knife folder over a buckle folder, you ask? I'll tell you. So a knife folder will be able to fold a larger amount of papers. So in booklet making or saddle stitching, you're going to be folding multiple sheets of paper. Uh, and uh, so because of that, that's why you see knife folding on a booklet maker. This is a knife folder down in here as well. So here is essentially the exact setup uh, that as, well, I feel like I need to get a light again. That's a little better. So here your paper is going to come in down underneath here and it goes underneath these two chrome rollers and underneath those chrome rollers is the knife mechanism that will then push your booklet up between the two chrome rollers and then between these two rubber rollers that continue to squeeze the booklet closed and then it will go into the trimmer next. A big advantage to a buckle folder is speed. The sheet basically never stops. It hits a stop and then pretty much immediately continues on through the folder so you can fold much faster on a buckle folder but you can only fold one piece of paper at a time accurately. You can fold multiple sheets if you're trying to hand feed. I know on the, uh, the tabletop folder I will sometimes hand feed in booklets to fold them again uh, but your accuracy goes down but you can do it. And if you're really getting into complicated projects you can actually get a knife folder to put in line with a buckle folder. Uh, so if you have a large signature that gets folded down, the thicker it gets, uh, the, a knife folder would be a better choice to fold that. Um, I know MBO, pretty much all the major folders makes that as well. Something else that you'll see on folders is a water score. And that is a very thin stream of water that softens the paper where it's going to be folded that can help in folding. You don't see it that often. I've never used one here. Uh, it's just because my applications are pretty standard, so I don't have a need for it. Other things you're going to take into consideration when folding is certainly grain direction. Uh, if you're new to the channel, I talk about grain direction a lot. And, uh, oh yeah, and scoring. I forgot, this is a knife folder as well, actually. Uh, I don't know that we can see the knives. Oh, but there's a cutaway. Here we go. So here you see a knife. As the, the page comes across, knife pushes it up and the knife can push it out that roller. So back to scoring. You're gonna wanna be scoring cover stock um, you can get away with going against the grain or with the grain when it comes to scoring. However, it's always better to keep your fold and your score parallel to the grain direction. Uh, and that's just because it folds better that way. Basically, every sheet of paper has a grain direction. And like this sheet, the grain runs in this direction. And you can... It's, it's already trying to fold itself in this direction, but in this direction, it's a lot more rigid. So 
when you're just folding a single lightweight sheet of paper, it's not a big deal. You're going to get a cleaner fold, though, if you do fold it in the direction parallel with the grain. This really doesn't have anything to do with folding equipment, but now would be a good time to also mention when you're designing a fold, you should take things into consideration. Let me grab a piece of paper and we can do a tri-fold uh, because it's popular to think if you have a, let's just say, 11 inch long piece of paper, like an eight and a half by 11, and you want to do a tri-fold, when you're designing it, your panels should not just be a third. You can't take a sheet of paper and divide it in thirds and fold it. You need to make your panels fit inside each other. Let me show you. Okay, so let's, uh, just for visual purposes, this is the outside, and we're gonna call this panel one, two, and three. So panel one and two can be the same exact size, but your third panel here is going to need to be just a little bit smaller because it needs to fit inside those first two panels. And the reality is too, in large complex folds, you're going to have to calculate the thickness of the paper into the fold if you're going to do a right angle trifold and things like that if you're really concerned about accuracy. But uh, it's a very common uh, mistake for people to make that just design their brochure on thirds with everything centered. But then when it comes time to fold, your inside panel is going to be off centered because of that. So. You need to do like a dummy before you do your design. Fold one out, measure it, and then replicate it. And if you don't know what a dummy is, a dummy is just like a dry run. Folding it uh, and making sure that your panels are all correct. Uh, it comes in really handy when you do uh, like an eight page signature to make sure that the correct pages are at the right spot. Um, it just saves time and, uh, and money if you make a mistake further down the road. Shout out to Update. And thank you for the shirts. I, uh, I have bought parts and supplies from Update over the years and just out of the blue. They showed up in the mail. It was pretty sweet. Thank you. Also want to say thank you to all you guys and gals out there uh, that watch my videos. I really enjoy the comments, the emails. Um, it sounds, it's awesome because there's so many people out there that have very similar stories to me of growing up in printing or, you know, all kinds of stories. I enjoy reading them. Sorry, I don't always get back in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, there's tons of emails and comments to go through. Uh, so just bear with me. Sometimes it takes a week or two. But thank you. Thank you for commenting and watching. Uh, I'm enjoying myself and I know others are as well. To wrap up this video, I want to try and do more question and answers of answering people's comments through the video. Um, so, boy, a lot of people that contact me, I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce your names. So you know who you are because you emailed me about this question, but I have three questions here. Uh, that I'm going to answer. First question is, do you have advice to go with non-genuine supplies such as toner cleaning blades? Do OEM because I've tried generic uh, drums to try and rebuild my drum. It was no, no good. However, I did just get a second brand that I got to try. Here. So before to rebuild my drum, I got a just a drum. And then as I was taken apart, I realized that there's actually three items that wear out. There's a lubricating roller that has powdered wax on it, a cleaning blade, and then your drum. Uh, so I found a second type of rebuild kit and it comes with a blade and a drum. So I'm looking forward to trying this. I think this is like 80 bucks or something. 
and a drum unit would be what 300 something so I, I I hope this works it's it comes from somebody that I trust a lot more than eBay so we'll see I'll keep you updated when I rebuild one but as far as toner and other stuff like that I find that the OEM stuff is pretty much the same price as generic so just go OEM question two do you think Konica is cheaper to run than Xerox maybe it is cheaper if you're paying for service uh, that was one of the reasons that I switched from Xerox to Konica machines is my lower cost of ownership it was a cheaper machine and cheaper clicks I don't have any experience with trying to service a Xerox machine on my own so I have no idea what parts and supplies cost for that but I'm happy with what I'm paying to service my own equipment uh, I do need to update everybody um, how that's going uh, and all that information actually is updated monthly on my patreon page so you can check that out if you're curious and question three is what will happen if I print more than the duty cycle recommended by the manufacturer it's simple uh, your quality will just degrade uh, there's nothing wrong with running your machine until there's a problem uh, and the reason I say that is you might for a drum for example might be uh, run out at a hundred percent but I've run drums to like 280 you know up to 300 percent and if you if it looks good if the quality is good keep on running it because you're going to get more money's worth out of that part uh, there's there's very few parts that I would recommend that you change just because it has passed its duty cycle uh, there is a case where that would make sense and I would suggest doing that if you're already taking uh, like a fuse or a part and you're all the way in there by all means uh, if it takes you 20 minutes to get in there replace the bearings along with it or uh, you know in an instance like that where you're already into a project you're in there you might as well just replace a couple more cheap parts to keep it up and running in those cases it makes sense so i hope that was helpful thanks everybody for watching catch you next week